Give me some candy. Welcome to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where we trade in personal finance advice for entertaining conversations about money, millennials, and the young at heart. Welcome, welcome world to yet another edition of Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where I, your co-host Ben Carter, am joined by my wonderful co-host, Mr. Malcolm Etheridge. Malcolm, what's going on, man? Uh, you know, same old same, man. I, I just noticed as I was walking into the studio that it, uh, the seasons are changing. Indeed they are. It's getting a little nippy out there. This is when I get a little depressed because as a Californian, I feel like seasons are stupid. See, but I, ha I have friends from California who say that they like the East Coast because they get the seasons. They're lying. They they wanted to see the weather change and blah blah blah. They weren't born and raised in California. Yeah, that sounds stupid to me. So I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, like yeah, if, yeah. if Pasadena, for example, is what 78 degrees on a bad day. So <laughs> to me, it's like, why would you leave paradise for this? Right. You know, like we we have two seasons here in D.C. Right, right, for sure. Uh, well, what's also interesting, which we talked about really quickly, but I don't know if you'll believe it. Uh, the triplets mm -hmm. are turning one in October. I can and I can't. Like, I can believe it in the sense that, like, you know, I feel like I've been seeing them on my Facebook feed for about a year now. And, uh -huh. and feels right. It feels right. But then I can't in the sense that, like, time is flying. It does. Like, if you're there, then that means I'm there. Yes. So that year also flew by me. Absolutely. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, it's a crazy thing. Uh, for those who may be listening or watching for the first time, I'm the father of three, well, I can't, not three triplet girls, but triplet girls, because that would make, would that make a nine? If I said three girls that were born on the same day. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and it's been a whirlwind, but my wife and I, we made it through somehow, through the <laughs> strength of our community and people's goodwill, lots of mm -hmm. angels and mm -hmm. blessings, that's right. Indeed, and uh, somehow we made it through, so uh, we'll be celebrating one in October. Um, and also my and my wife's survival, which is, you know. So I remember when I was a kid and I used to go to church, uh -huh. and I remember specifically when, like, somebody would get up to do the testimonial for the day. No, oh, that was a testimony. And they would say, like, somebody prayed for me this morning. <laughs> I feel like that's basically what you just said. Absolutely. Like somebody's been praying for me this year. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Well, uh, on this episode of Manage Your Damn Money, uh, we have an interesting conversation, professional and career turning points. And we'll get into what we mean by that in just a moment. But before we do that, as we do on every show, it is now time for headlines. <laughs> Budget deficit on path to surpass $1 trillion under Trump. Uh, this was an August 2019 piece on the New York Times by Jim Tankersley and Emily Cochran. The federal budget deficit is growing faster than expected as President Trump's spending and tax cut policies forced the United States to borrow increasing sums of money. The deficit, the gap between what the government takes in through taxes and the other sources of revenue and what it spends, will reach $960 billion for the 2019 fiscal Yay. year. Yes, indeed, uh, which, which ends September 30th. That gap will widen to one trillion for the 2020 fiscal year, says the Congressional Budget Office um, in an updated forecast. Uh, the updated projections show deficits rising um, and damage from Mr. Trump's tariffs mounting faster than the office had previously predicted. In May, the Budget Office said it expected a deficit of 80, 896 billion dollars for 2019 and 892 billion for 2020. That damage would be even higher if not for lower than expected interest rates, which are reducing the amount of money the government has to pay to its lenders. Still, the 2019 deficit is projected to be 25% larger than it was in 2018, and the budget office predicts it will continue to rise every year through 2023. Um, by 2029, Malcolm, the national debt will reach its highest level as a share of the economy since the immediate aftermath of World War II. Um, the increasing levels of red ink stem from steep fall off in federal revenue from uh, Trump's tax cuts of 2017 or the jobs, mm -hmm. ta jobs cuts and whatever the tax cuts and jobs act tax cuts and jobs act indeed um, which lowered individual and corporate tax rates resulting in far fewer tax dollars flowing into the treasury department um, tax revenues for 2018 and 2019 have fallen more than 430 billion dollars short of what the budget office predicted they would be in june of 2017 before the tax law was approved 
Um, so this kind of begs a question for me, Malcolm, mm -hmm. which I kind of did a real, real little bit of research on. Um, how does the national debt affect us as individuals? Um, and a kind of technical explanation is, um, this comes from the U.S. News and World Report and Investopedia, more government bonds cause higher interest rates mm -hmm. and lower stock market returns. Um, and as the U.S. government issues more treasury securities to cover its budget deficit, the market supply of bonds increases. Um, and when you have more of something, it gets cheaper, um, which was someone quoted in, the, in one of the pieces. And so then, so what, what does that mean? Yeah, let me, let me, I hate to use this phrase, but let me dumb that down for a second. Please do. So essentially what you're saying is I can borrow money from the federal government for, let's say, 5% interest. Right. So I have a bond that's going to mature in 30 years. So for the next 30 years, the federal government has agreed to pay me 5% interest on that bond. Right. And then they'll return me my initial principal when it's all said and done, so I, I didn't lose anything. Right. If I'm looking at the stock market, mm -hmm. the long-term average of the stock market returns you somewhere between like 7 and 8%, depending on where you draw it back to and where you stop. Right. So if I'm looking at that and the quote-unquote risk-free rate of return is 5%, because right. I just told you I'll get all my money back right. and the interest along the way. My incentive is to... What is my incentive to go after that 7 or 8% return right. that could do God knows what in right. any given one year, 2008, for example, right. when I know for a fact I can get five. From the government. From the government. So right. if interest rates are that high and they're paying that well on those bonds, mm -hmm. it then negatively impacts the stock market because most people are going to look at that and say, well, why would I invest there and take that risk when I can get that for free? So they pull their money out of the stock market, put it in and bonds. buy bonds. Indeed, indeed. Um, also, the cost of borrowing money uh, to purchase a home will increase because of the cost of money in the mortgage lending market is directly tied to short-term interest rates set by the Federal Reserve and the yield offered on Treasury securities, Malcolm. Um, so understanding the national debt and how it impacts individuals is, feels like a long line to follow. Mm -hmm. How is it that these billions and billions and trillions and trillions and, and the word we use here on the show, gaffillions, is that our word? That's not our word, that's Austin Powers' word. It Oh. A million gazillion fulfillion. You really don't remember that? My pop, pop culture reference is always so lost, like in the ether <laughs> when we talk about this. Like, but anyway. <sighs> anyway, so. So how do you simplify that? Well, so you talked about a whole, not, a whole nother very key element to this whole thing, which is interest rates on mortgages. Right. So right now, we're watching the president bully the Federal Reserve chairman into lowering interest rates so that people will continue to borrow money to buy houses, namely. Um, and it just so happens that this dude is a large real estate developer mm -hmm. who borrows money to build real estate projects, right. who wants interest rates on lending for real estate purchases to be as low and as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. Go figure. So the reason that that makes such a difference is that a quarter of a point adjustment in an in interest rate, so if mm -hmm. your interest rate is 3.75 today, mm -hmm it going to 4% tomorrow could make the difference between you actually getting approved for a mortgage or not, right. based on what the bank determines to be your affordability. Mm -hmm. So that deficit and our ability to pay those interest rates again and again also negatively impacts, in some cases, people's ability to achieve their American dream today. Because the deficit pushes up the price of a mortgage. Those same bonds we're talking about. Rate. So in the short term, those same bonds have an interest rate that needs to be less than what it is longer term. Uh -huh. So if I'm borrowing uh, 10 years, mm -hmm. I should have to pay you less interest on a 10 year mm -hmm. than if I'm borrowing money for 30 years. Because right, right. your risk is triple, basically, right. right? If I'm borrowing money 30 years versus 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that right there is where the disconnect currently is mm -hmm. with our interest rates, that short term rates and long term rates are about the same thing. Right. So then you have that question of who's going to buy those longer term bonds. Right. So in order to entice people to buy longer term bonds, I have to pay higher interest rates. Absolutely. And then absolutely. that kind of skews things all over again. OK. Um, and then a little bit more macro side. It sounds beneficial for the national net debt not to be so high. It's always beneficial for the national debt to not be so high. Indeed, indeed. So what, what can a normal person do when it comes to pushing for, advocating for, or wanting a national debt that is lower? And I mean, it's always seemed like it's high since I've been an adult. Well, so like we've been running a deficit in this country since I believe mm -hmm. our fact checkers, I'm sure, will email us gleefully if I'm wrong. <laughs> 
But I believe when Clinton left office was mm-hmm. the last time we were at a surplus. That's what I remember too. And since then, it's been spent on wars and walls and right. tax cuts and all kind of nonsense. Mm-hmm. And so maybe you get a president who's not a warmonger, who doesn't want to spend money on any additional social impact programs, who doesn't want to issue any additional bonds than what already exists, who's a deficit killer. Like those, that's, a, that's a lot of different things. That's a lot one. of people in one person, right? It's, it's not Bernie. It's not yeah. Warren. It's not Definitely Harris. Not it's Bernie. not Booker. It's right. like it's not Trump clearly because right. he's already wrecked it. So there's a lot of people that need to be in one person to make <laughs> all those things actually come to fruition. Right. And I just don't see it. like even like if you think about the Affordable Care Act, for mm-hmm. example, that's pretty expensive yeah. to pay for health care for 30 million additional people. Right. That's kind of costly. Right. Or if you think about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I basically said the people who make the most money pay the least amount in taxes proportionally. Mm-hmm. And the people who make the middle incomes, you're increased, but it doesn't offset one for one. Right. So there again, you kind of wrecked it with right. that tax cut that said businesses, you don't really have to pay anything, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't want to. Right. We appreciate it if you do, but if you don't want to, no problem. Right. Those two things don't really align. So I don't know who comes in that changes that. I think it sounds like a president unicorn mm. is the answer. Okay. Anyway. Uh, I want to remind people we could always catch past episodes of Manager Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. Um, you can also please send us your questions or your topic suggestions to info at managerdamnmoney.com. And of course, you can always catch us on social media, on Twitter or on Instagram. My handle is at MYDM1. Malcolm, what's yours? Uh, at Malcolm on Money. And you can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash Manager Damn Money. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back. Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money with Ben and Malcolm, where on this episode, we are talking about professional and career turning points. We are entering the fall season, which is the prelude to the close of the year. With the closing of the year comes a great time to evaluate the next steps in your career. Beyond what jobs to take next or how to secure that promotion, it's also important to consistently re- reevaluate if, like Donnell Jones, Malcolm, you're truly where you wanna oh be. I don't, I don't know how I never see you building in these opportunities. Never like did I imagine. Harmonized by yourself <laughs> over the. I, 
that you would play a special oh part and in a decision going. that's Like, so I read hard. that, and I didn't realize that's where you were going to land somehow. Should I leave? Should I stay? Should I go? Anyway, um, on this MRI. You're going to skip the sweetie, dee, 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 like, you sweetie, went through all that, and you didn't even, like, dee, dee. all right, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> like, you didn't even do the best anyway. All right. Anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I know you always enjoy when I sing. On this episode of Manage Your Damn Money, Malcolm and I will explore some interesting and unlikely career turning points that may or may not have heard, that you may or may not have heard of in hopes we can help you think critically about your next career move. Um, we'll also talk about uh, taking, uh, we'll be talking to a business owner who took a turn in his career that he never expected to take, Malcolm. So first of all, conceptually speaking, in your mm -hmm. mind, Malcolm, because this is somewhat of an idea sprung out of my own mind, out of a conversation I was having, what is a career turning point in your mind? Um, when you realize that you shouldn't be doing the thing that you are doing, even if you're good at the thing that you're, you are doing, because you could be better at that other thing that you should be doing. Interesting. Okay. Or your commute sucks and you want to find something you can do from home uh -huh. so that you don't have that commute problem. And so you just blow up your world completely just for the sake of a work from home job. Absolutely. Because I've been advocating for that. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been advocating for that a lot on Twitter. For who? People in general. Like every time I see like, these are the 12 work from home jobs that are, that are like biggest in DC. Uh -huh. I'm like retweet, 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 <laughs> retweet. Is like that for you or for other emailing people? Emailing it to people. Well, I work from home half the time now. So I'm like, I recognize how awesome this is. So I want to <laughs> share this with the people because it's life changing. Uh, speaking of you, can you say you've had any career turning points? And I feel like you have. My entire career has been a turning point, <laughs> one after the other. But specifically, like the thing that got me here uh -huh. was, you know that I come from the car business, both right. in sales and in management. And in my opinion, I was pretty good at it. Okay. However, there came a point where I was like, this is about as far as I'm probably gonna go with this. And people, do, I, don't, I don't feel like people know for sure that you used to sell cars back in the day they do if they spent 10 minutes talking to me about like how i got here <laughs> because i usually tell people like it's how i learned to talk to people right like realistically you learn within like 30 seconds how to convey the information that you need somebody to understand long enough for them to not be like all right dude beat it right so that's a valuable skill that i always encourage college students like when they're like what's the thing that i should be learning right now while i'm in school mm -hmm. that's going to help me in my career blah 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 you know those right. questions it's always for me it's like get a sales job i don't care what you're selling whether you hate the product or you hate sales right. or talking to people or whatever get a sales job do it for two or three years and it'll be an invaluable skill that will carry you through like a 50-year career after that. I think that's true. Um, would you also consider your pivot from large financial institution firms managing money under, you know, the flag of banks and whatnot, mm -hmm. to now working at a, a boutique, you know, financial management firm or whatever you want to call it? Well, yes and yes. Yes, because I left the, the bureaucracy and the nonsense of, you know, that world behind. Right. But separately, it's different because I own a stake in it now. Right. So, you know, not to say that I care any differently, but like I care a little bit more <laughs> when the lights get left on or, you know, it's like, do I really have to take this trip to visit this person face to face or uh -huh. can I Skype? Like those kind of things change. You, you, when you turning you know, off the lights at your firm before everyone's left the office is You know hilarious. what's really funny? Quick complete diversion. Uh -huh. I was at a friend's house for brunch uh -huh. this past weekend and I'm so in homeowner mode uh -huh. that like every time she left the water on in her own house <laughs> I reached over and hit the switch and turned it off like because I mean it happened like three or four different times and everybody else kept noticing and laughing at me but I didn't even care. It was instinctual and then when I really realized I was doing it uh -huh. I was like I don't even care I'm doing this for you <laughs> right like I'm doing this for your water bill. That's funny. Uh, I do the same thing, by the way. Uh, well, it's interesting. In my own life, a career turning point for me personally was uh, I had gotten into communications consulting for a bit of time, mm -hmm. um, and then I paid my taxes for the first time, <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, abort mission, <laughs> abort mission. I need to go back to full-time work because this paying your taxes in April is not cool. So quarterly prepaid taxes, not for you. I mean, that's what you were supposed to do. But I, at the time, I wasn't making enough money to mm. like do that part. So I was like, oh, no, I'll just so you thought I'll just save and then, you know, I'll do it in April. And boy, 
Did that hurt? <laughs> um, so that was anyway. So that was a career turning point for me, or example of one. Um, and another one that we pulled for setting up this show uh, was a story on Fortune.com by Carolyn, Carolyn Fairchild in September 2014. The headline read, "How Karen Kaplan went from receptionist to CEO." Uh, Karen Kaplan didn't even want to work in the advertising industry when she applied for her first job at a Boston-based ad firm called Hill Holiday. At the age of 22, Kaplan walked into the company's office for an interview to be a receptionist. She was looking for a low commitment job that would help pay the bills while she saved money for law school and studied for the LSAT. Um, some 32 years later, Kaplan hasn't left Hill Holiday. Now, after having 16 different jobs at the firm, she's, she's the company's chief executive. And an interesting story about this, I actually interned at this ad agency in, 2000, really? when I was, in 2008. When I was, so do you know Carolyn? I, I think I probably crossed paths with her. I don't remember if, and she might have, yeah, I don't know. I probably passed by her. I, I don't remember any experience with her ex explicitly, but she was there while I was there. Um, <laughs> and then uh, to, a, to the That's what you say about somebody that went to college with you. Like, <laughs> they weren't my year, but they were there when I was there. Right. Uh, and then to the question uh, asked to her in a piece that we pulled, were you surprised when you became the CEO? She says it wasn't like she started in 1982 as a receptionist and decided it, she was going to be the CEO of the company someday. Uh, I never planned on spending my entire career here. I went to four different undergraduate schools in four years. I was the last person to spend her entire career at one company. Malcolm, uh, so what do you think the motivation would be for someone to spend their entire career at a company and end up in such a high-ranking position like, uh, like Karen? It's timing. I think if the company starts out small enough or you start out at the company when it is small enough, mm -hmm. then it's absolutely possible that you go from being employee number 30 right. to employee number... 30 of 3,000 or 30,000 right. because you got there at the time when they were still in growth mode. Right. But if you started a as a receptionist at a company with 30,000 employees today, right. the likelihood is kind of, you know, I, I don't know. And the, and the, I, the reason I pulled this, because this is an interesting turning point of she wasn't really expecting to become the CEO of mm -hmm. the agency where she started as a receptionist. So at. she says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, I mean, to be a receptionist and then end up a CEO, I don't imagine that's what she was thinking, at least at that time. It's an interesting turning point, so to speak. Um, but a couple other examples of career turning points. Uh, five entrepreneurs who changed careers at midlife and triumph. This was a November 2017 piece on entrepreneur.com by Jyoti Agrawal. Um, career anxiety is our latent talent howling, our latent talent howling through our minds, desperate not to go to the grave unspent. These beautiful words are from the Book of Life, an online collection of thoughts about what constitutes emotional intelligence, but they also carry a bit of truth which sometimes hurts, sometimes scares. It can even get scarier when at midlife you find yourself thinking about leaving your 20-year-old job or building a business from scratch. To, to affect this kind of change is not an easy decision to make. However, it does not mean it cannot be done. So uh, one of the first examples this particular story goes on to give is uh, when chemist Laura Pastor was 40. She wanted to work outside of the lab without necessarily leaving the company. Having few options in the organization, she thought about what she loved about her job. After realizing that her being a chemist had allowed her to look at an individual problem and solve each of them, she grabbed the opportunity to be a part-time human resources team member. Um, with a pay cut involved, Pastor's choice did not seem appealing, but she found her calling in a different setting, Malcolm. And that's an example of someone saying, a chemist, I'm doing this over here, and needing a change. Mm -hmm. And she actually became a HR human resources person, which the two don't even seem like they match. A chemist and human resources, like those things don't even seem like there's any natural transition. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely a turning point. Also, another one that the story mentions, Julia Child became famous as the chef for introducing French cuisine to mainstream America. But the celebrated chef also once served her country as an intelligence officer in the Office of Strategic Services, um, the precursors to the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, she was appointed chief of office registry in Sri Lanka and parts of China from 1944 to 1945. Um, during her OSS career, uh, she met her would-be husband, Paul Child. It was Paul who led Julia to appreciate French cuisine, according to a CIA commemorative article. So here's where I'm confused by that. Okay. You know who Julia Child is enough to know like why that's weird? Go ahead. So Julia Child, I 
worked for the CIA, but she's got like the most distinctive voice of all of TV <laughs> chef person. I don't think it was American CIA. I think it was Sri Lanka. And... I, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> if there's anything she ever had to do in her life that uh -huh. was covert, the lady that talks like, you dropped the chicken. <laughs> in the, like, I'm going to immediately know that's her. Like, so if I'm, if I'm like on a wiretap, uh, I'm immediately like, Julia, that's you? <laughs> like, what are you doing over here in Sri Lanka? So, like, to me, when I first read that, I was like, I, I was, there's no way Julia Child was a CIA operative. I don't believe it. <laughs> I was going to bless you with my, what I think Julia Child sounded like, because I barely remember, but you did a far better job. So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, the last example in this story was Vera Wang was an editor at Vogue um, for 17 years before she began designing wedding gowns loved by brides all around the world. Before Vogue, she was a teenage figure skater aspiring to make it to the Olympics. It was a long road for this entrepreneur. Um, people, she, uh, Vera Wang said in the piece, people have done far better than me in far shorter periods of time, but that wasn't my story. Uh, she went on to say, uh, so th this was just a little piece from whatever piece I pulled. But anyway, uh, wh what are questions people should ask themselves, Malcolm, when they're in their career and where they are and they're considering something different? Like Before I answer that, there's one that I find super fascinating that you missed in there, okay. which is Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, who actually was a paper cup salesman for 20 years huh. before he like bought, basically bought the McDonald's franchise okay. and started franchising it out across the country from the one location they had in San Bernardino. Okay. So he was like 52 or 55 okay. when he founded McDonald's as we know it today. Oh, wow. And everybody thought he was crazy because he was like a super successful paper cup salesman. Like, I can't even believe that's a thing. Right. But according to him, like, he saw, obviously I read his, like, autobiography, right? So according to him, he saw the end of the paper cup era coming. <laughs> and decided he needed to find something else to focus on. So that's that big pivot that I was alluding to before. Right. So I found that personally like super interesting that like at 55, he's like, mm, life's pretty good, but it's time to disrupt this a little bit. Like, let me find something else I'm not qualified to do and learn it as fast as I can so I can be successful at it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if people are considering something that's different from what they've always done or maybe different from what they expected, yeah. what are some questions that flow to your mind in terms of addressing that appropriately? How prepared are you financially to be wrong? Uh, like, if you completely fall flat on your face, how much time do you have based on the amount of money that you have in the bank to see it through right. before you've got to turn back and go the other way. Right. So if I, for example, you know, am deciding to leave my job as a salesman and go start a franchise, it's going to take six months, let's say, before I can expect to make any real money doing it right. or even pay myself a salary doing it. Mm -hmm. Can I afford to live still for that six months between now and then? That's a key concern to me about being able to make that jump, right? which is the reason an emergency savings is so important. Absolutely. Um, and then two, uh, when you're evaluating your career, what are key components in your mind to maximizing your income, no matter what job you take on? Uh, and if you're in full-time work, mm -hmm. put entrepreneurship aside for a second. Uh, what are some you know, keys in terms of making sure you're maximizing that? Well, going after additional certifications and qualifications and all that kind of stuff while you're in the role you're in. Mm -hmm would allow you to maximize that pay potential too. Mm -hmm. So you could, and I've actually seen this because while I was at uh, Georgetown studying for my <laughs> CFP, there were a couple of career changers in there mm -hmm. that they hadn't quite started at a financial services firm yet. They were right. still working as like, you know, for the NSA or something, for example, mm -hmm. and studying to become a financial planner okay. with the idea that once I've completed the certification process, then I'll make that jump Transition. because it won't be as difficult to do because people will know that like I'm serious about this. Right. So that's an example to me of kind of hedging your bet mm -hmm. a little bit. But also if you do the same thing inside of your field, mm -hmm. it kind of says that this person is serious about their you know, role here and they take what they're planning to do seriously enough that I need to step it up pay wise to make sure that I keep that person because they're obviously interested in more than where they are right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we're going to take a quick music break, uh, but before we do that, I want to tell you that we have a guest on this episode. He goes by the name of Mr. Sean Williams. He's the president of a company called Fortis Mortgage, and we're going to talk to him about his own personal 
career turning point is a very interesting story, which we'll get into when we come back from this music break. Um, but first, I want to remind you, you can always catch past episodes of Manage Your Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, and also Spotify. Please leave us a review on any of those platforms. It helps more people catch the show. Um, if you have a question or you have a topic you want us to cover, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. And of course, you can always catch us on social media. My handle is at mydm one Malcolm, what's yours? At Malcolm on Money. And that's on Twitter and on Instagram. And of course, you can catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. This is MYDM with Ben and Malcolm. We will be right back. Welcome back to Manage Your Damn Money, where today's conversation at hand is professional and career turning points. On this episode of MYDM, we've been discussing career turning points. I'm honored to have on our show the person who literally inspired this show. After talking to him about a major career turning point of his own, I was so moved, I just had to come up with a way and a reason to give him the opportunity to come on our show and share it with our Manager Damn Money I'm audience. Now I know the truth, <laughs> how we got here. Indeed, indeed. Um, I'm happy to welcome Mr. Sean Williams to the show. Sean, how are you today, sir? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Welcome to the show, Thank sir. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I should say you are the president of a company called Fortis Mortgage. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do at Fortis Mortgage. All right, so first and foremost, though, I'm a husband. Okay. Right? Get it right. <laughs> Get that right. Yeah, I'm a father, and, uh, you know, I coach a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the biggest thing for me is that I believe in honesty, integrity, you know, transparency, and that's the way I like to uh, to do business. And in the mortgage business? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you, sir. Yeah, yeah. I heard you mention earlier you were in car sales, mm -hmm. and so... Um, actually, car sales is a step up above the mortgage <laughs> industry from my understanding. It didn't used to lot. be like that, but back in 2008, uh, yeah. um, we took a slide. Uh, also live in gratitude every day, but, uh, you know, the question that you asked me specifically about Fortis Mortgage, uh, I'm the owner mm -hmm. of Fortis Mortgage, the president, founder of Fortis Mortgage, and simply put, we help uh, people, you know, find the best mortgage. Okay, absolutely, and that's for buying homes, of course. Yeah, buying um, or selling, uh, buying, buying or refinancing a home. Absolutely, and real quick, uh, recently, recent news, uh, rates just dropped again, or the Fed lowered rates again. Tell us quickly what that means for people who are in the market for refinancing or potentially buying a home for the for for first or second or third time. Right, I, I get this and I see this a lot. I won't go into a ton of detail about it. And Malcolm, you know a good bit too as well by being a financial advisor. But the Fed doesn't set the mortgage rates. Mm -hmm. They don't set the mortgage rates. So it's uh, when you hear about the Fed fund rates changing uh, uh, recently, like where it's lower, 
that affects like uh, home equity lines of credit, like variable rates that might affect or uh, help your credit cards. Uh, it might all, and it also helps like banks in which they borrow money from each other. So your checking account or savings and money market may be a little better. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times it has an adverse reaction uh, and it negatively affects our mortgage rates because we, we, I heard you guys speaking or talking earlier uh, about the bonds mm -hmm. uh, uh, versus stocks. And so stocks is more aggressive. Folks are putting their money in the stock market. So there's less demand, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for the bonds or the, the less risky play. Mm -hmm. And so when you see a movement from stocks into bonds, that's when you'll start to see our mortgage interest rates change for the better. Okay. Um, and then when you see folks kind of take their money out of the safe play, and start to gamble a little bit in the stock market, mm -hmm. that's when you'll see the mortgage interest rates uh, rise. And that's when it'll become more expensive. That's when it becomes more expensive, yeah, to buy a home. So okay. that's, uh, simply put, you just look between the two. Okay. Yeah. Now, we've been talking about career turning points here. Um, and the reason why we're having this show is because you and I were on the phone, and we were just talking about, I, we were talking about your story, oops, we were talking about your story and how uh, you became or started Fortis Mortgage. Why don't you tell me about your career and where it took you and kind of like the trajectory and how you ended up where you are now? Okay, so I started out, um, I, I started out in NPR. I was in Human hmm. Resources. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. More, more I'm glad I didn't say it. <laughs> so that's where I started my career. Glad I didn't say anything bad yeah. about the HR lady you were talking about before. So I was in Human Resources and I did employee benefits okay. and new hires would come in and I'd, I'd make sure that they understood their benefits and such. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a, a study, I was doing that while I was in school in college, and I studied abroad for a summer semester. Let my hair grow out, you know, <laughs> just, you know, went there and had a great time. And I kind of figured out that, hey, listen, I wanted to kind of get away from the desk. And uh, uh, sales was it. Mm -hmm. Getting into sales was it. Because it's my understanding, uh, if you're looking to uh, understand how business works and business operates, the best way to do that is uh, to get into sales and mm -hmm. to sell a product because right. you get every single facet of a business by being in a sales environment or sales organization. So I did that, got into insurance for a bit. Uh, and then a very good friend of mine who I grew up with since you know we were six years old, and uh, he got into the mortgage business and he climbed and he did very well. He was the top five uh, mortgage lender or originator, I should say, in, the, in America. Uh, during the time, I uh, had a situation where my, my grandmother had passed away, and obviously he's my best friend, and we're talking quite a bit. And so while we're, we're discussing it, I start to ask him more and more questions about uh, his business and what he was doing. And so naturally, uh, he uh, sort of twisted my arm a little bit, <laughs> and uh, I got into this business. But the main reason was he would always tell me, like, you know, you remember when we were growing up and you were talking about giving back and helping the community? Uh, doing all these great things, this is your opportunity now hmm. to give back to the community. There's nothing like it, Sean. I haven't seen this before. They pay us money to help people build wealth. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I, uh, I, how I got into the mortgage industry. Okay, okay. Um, now, specifically, uh, this, I mean, that's an amazing story, which I didn't know anything about. Um, you worked at a company, too, for a bit of time and your career was on a certain track. And I kind of want you to walk us through sure. where you had intended your career to go and then where it ended up going. And you know, so walk me through that a bit. Okay, well, I was, uh, I was always on a management track. Right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I was always leading teams and, 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 and growing and scaling uh, uh, business, the business. And where it was leading was more of an executive track, all right, right. where Sean, you're not in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, like or, or I should say, uh, customer-facing mm -hmm. portion of the business. You're handling the operations. You're helping uh, uh, scale that particular side of the business and get getting in more into uh, the executive track. So uh, that actually ended up happening, uh, where I was able to climb a good bit uh, in in the company that I worked at. You know, for a very very a good amount of time, uh, I ended up being uh, one of the top districts or regions. Uh, within the company, within the country, and then uh, uh, what I thought was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, came about, and so uh, so I took that opportunity. Uh, so to answer your question, it was really about for me just getting on an executive track. Mm -hmm. Now, was that in a world related to mortgage 
finance, banking, that sort of thing, or was it a complete 180 from? No, once I got into the mortgage industry, I knew I wanted to uh, be in a leadership position mm -hmm. uh, within the industry just to move the needle for uh, myself mm -hmm. and for the people around me as well. But, uh, but no, it was always in the mortgage industry. I knew I wanted to be in the leadership. Okay. aspect of it. Now you made it to executive level which I imagine was like the goal and then you take a pivot to entrepreneurship. Yes. Tell me about the the kind of realization you, you had been in your executive role and what pushed you towards moving towards entrepreneurship after having you know invested in the time of building that career. Right right understood so um, I think I heard you earlier you guys were talking about um, uh, corporate structure and such uh, sometimes, you know, you're sitting at a table uh, like we are here mm -hmm. um, and there, there, there's, there are people making decisions, uh, so to speak, and you think that you have a specific voice to uh, help you or help the company make that particular decision. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you realize that you, you don't have the voice mm -hmm. that you think you had, uh -huh. right? And so in my situation, um, uh, parted ways with the last company, we parted ways, and uh, I'm sitting there and, and, and we're thinking about the, the moves that we're going to make. And, uh, uh, you know, I write down everything that I like. You know, Sean, what would you be good at? What do you like to do? Are you going to stay in this business? Um, are you going to do something different? And this is you asking yourself internally? This, this was at, okay. asking myself. I actually wrote it down, too, as well, mm -hmm. asking myself internally, um, you know, what, what I was going to do. And all roads kept leading back uh, to start a mortgage company. Hmm. Because the thing is, is I've been in sales and, and, and uh, doing mortgages for folks, and I'm like, okay, I could go to another company and do that, but no, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I, I could go start another branch for someone, uh, build a team. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I want to do that. Stay in this executive track, uh, right, but maybe be in a similar situation where I don't have as much as c uh, control as I would possibly like to have. So one thing happened, I was on LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn tells you everything, yeah. right? Someone changes jobs. Whenever a change happens, you get alerted by it. LinkedIn is my favorite social media platform, yeah. so I'm with you. That's where I'm most active is through LinkedIn. So one of the biggest things that I talk about is building relationships before you need them, mm -hmm. right? And so there was a gentleman that I had worked with at one of my previous companies, and, and uh, I got a chance to interview him and help onboard him and bring him into the uh, company. He was working in a completely different district. And uh, we got a chance to get to know each other. He left the company part ways, and I saw an alert that popped up, president of such and such company. And I'm like, wow, yes. that's awesome, good for him. So naturally, I uh, hit him up and said, you know, hey, great, 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 congratulations. Um, and, he, and, he, and he hits me back and he's like, you know, give me a call when you get a chance. So I call him up and I'm like, man, that's amazing, dude. You, you're the president of this company now. <laughs> he's like, well, it's my company. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? Uh, okay, and this was during the time where I was asking myself these questions mm. about which direction I was gonna go. And so little did he know um, that I was building this company and start, I started to ask him more and more and more questions about it. And uh, you know, I say all that to say one thing led to another, and uh, it was finally uh, set where I'm like, okay, I'm going to start this mortgage company. I'm going to do it for myself. Excellent. So anybody who listens to or watches this show on a regular enough basis knows that both of us really are strong proponents of entrepreneurship. And one thing that I think tends to get lost in that conversation quite a bit is the fact that you're literally going from an income of let's say 100 100 percent to zero the very next day so you're going from 100 to zero the wrong direction talk us through that equation that helped you make the decision that even though you know i'm le and you're talking executive level so i assume it's a pretty decent hundred percent. I did okay. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you specifics, but I know. And so you're going from that down to zero the next day. Talk us through that equation and what allowed you to be able to finally make that decision to say, yes, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to essentially bet on myself right. to do it. So, so the biggest thing was buy-in from my family okay. because I've made some decisions in the past where I didn't really ask permission yeah. from the family. It's kind of like I'm convincing them that this is the best opportunity, right? And it's always like, you know, you start when you get married or whatever it might be. It's a pipe dream, right? 
until you prove yourself. You right. have to show proof concept, right? And so I've always been like, well, this is it, this is it, this is a great opportunity. So this time I said, you know what? Um, my wife's Andrea. Uh, I want to know that if I do this, that you are gonna support me, hmm. right? And I also ask my children if they would be okay because you know, sometimes daddy would miss dinner. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes daddy wouldn't be home on time right. to tuck them in, right. things of that nature. So I made sure that I asked those questions. And, and so going from uh, uh, zero, uh, or I apologize, from a good bit to zero, mm -hmm. not knowing what I was gonna make, the one thing that helped a lot is I contacted my uh, financial advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and he are pretty connected. I said, listen, I'm gonna go, I, I called him over to the house uh, I said, listen, I'm going to go back into my office and try to figure out uh, my, my strategy for building this business because this is something that I really want to do. If she says it's okay, I'm going to keep doing it. If she doesn't, then I'll go tomorrow and I'll get a job, right? Um, and so I said, can you tell her <laughs> how much money we have mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how long is it going to take before it runs out? So right? how much runway do you have before... <laughs> It's time to scrap this dream. Exactly. And go, okay. Yeah, and so I ran, scooted to my office, uh -huh. closed the door. They talked about it. Uh -huh. The next thing I know, I was being summoned uh, to the kitchen, <laughs> and uh, and you found you out know, you got approval. I, I found out that I could start a company. <laughs> um, and then, so the one thing, another thing that I real, just real quick, you didn't ask me this, but the, the one thing where I knew it was uh, it was meant to be, mm -hmm. uh, we were as a family thinking of names uh, for this business. Like, what are we gonna call this company? Mm -hmm. And my kids, they're, they're 10 and 11 years old. They're coming home from school and they're writing all these names up on the board. Cause I painted a big whiteboard in my office. Uh -huh. And so you can just take a dry erase marker and just write all over it. Some ridiculous names, their, their initials, whatever uh -huh. they're putting up there, right? And then so <clears throat> we thought we came up with a name, we didn't. Um, because it, was, uh, it wasn't unique enough, right? Someone else in like Massachusetts had the same name. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bummed, like, man, I had it all together. I was gonna get the URL registered and everything. You thought of something like M&T Bank, <laughs> thinking that was uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so my, my daughter, um, we're in the kitchen. She's like, don't worry, daddy. It's no big deal. When you get older, I'm gonna take over the business anyway. <laughs> so I'm just like, uh, this is it. I gotta do it. Uh -huh. So. That was a part of that story too, Excellent. as well. That's not what you guys asked me, but it was no, but that, that I wanted that, to throw in there. It, you that's know, helpful to build context, though. Yeah, yeah, and so there was really no no option for me not to uh, make this successful. It's it, you know I don't look at it as a situation where I went from a lot to nothing, mm -hmm. because I've always helped people, right? Um, I've you know I've always uh, done mortgages, so I knew I could go out there and build something that would be able to provide this service to our folks and be compensated for it. So right. that was never an issue. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so really quickly, uh, you've not been on your entrepreneurship journey long. How, how long has it been? Well, on paper, October 4th um, of, uh, of, of last 2018. year. So a yeah. year. So, so almost a year. A year. Okay. Okay. Right? So that's enough time to <laughs> ask you this question. What's the one thing that you feel like is most important that you've learned thus far as an entrepreneur? Um, I learned as an entrepreneur to stay in my lane, hmm. right? To figure out, not even to just embrace what I'm good at mm -hmm. and just stay in my lane. There's so many people that want to go out and spend all this money and, uh, and bring in uh, their own resources. With technology today and the relationships that we've been able to build and what I've been able to build over the past 15 years, mm -hmm. a lot of the things can be outsourced, hmm. right. right? So that's one thing as an entrepreneur I would say don't run out and try to grow too quickly. Really try to figure out, number one, who you are uh, and, and, and what your business is. Number two, what resources can you utilize uh, uh, to, to help scale your business right. um, and stabilize your business. So uh, like I said, just stay in your lane mm -hmm. and, and be okay with, uh, <clears throat> with outsourcing. Okay, excellent. Um, and then, uh, do you have any questions? Or? Yeah. I got all the questions, man. But I, like, I'm over here taking notes. Like, I, like, you know. So I've never actually put into words the concept that you said about building your network before you need it. Yes. Like, I consider myself a professional networker who just so happened to figure out a way to monetize that skill. But the whole build your network before you need it is something I, I never really put it into words that way. But then also, like, the idea of 
I can always go back and get a job tomorrow, right? Like I've said on this show multiple times, like normal is always going to be right there right. around the corner when you need it. Mm -hmm. So if at, at any point you ever get there and you're like, this is a little too much risk. It didn't go the way I expected it to go. My wife doesn't like me as much as she did before I started the business. My kids are complaining. They don't see me enough. You can always go back to normal. Like it'll always be there somewhere. Right. All yeah. the time. So why not take a shot or two? So like I'm I'm over here scribbling notes on, <laughs> on, on Sean's masterclass myself. Was, and you know we're in sales. So, you it, know, it's, it's pretty difficult not to be able to get another job in right. sales somewhere. That doesn't mean that you're going to perform right. at a high level, but you should be able to get a job um, somewhere. Indeed. Uh, final question before we close everything up. Uh, in your mind, what is most important for people to keep in mind if they're considering taking a different road in their career than maybe what they expected? <laughs> this question, man. Um, a again, I would just say for in my situation, just stay ready, mm -hmm. be prepared, because there was, you know, for me, 15 years, 14 years in a particular industry, mm -hmm. there's not much that I haven't seen, right? right? So. Uh, from the operations aspect of it, mm -hmm. the technology aspect, uh, just the actual how to treat a specific client or a customer. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say, like I said, to, uh, to stay ready and then just be confident in the skills, mm -hmm. the skills that you've learned uh, while you've been working. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that's the one thing that helped me a lot and what I would tell anyone that's looking to uh, pivot into something different okay. to do that. Okay. And if people want to get more information about Fortis Mortgage or Sean Williams, where can they find you? Um, like I said, LinkedIn is a place that I like to be. So if you're looking for Sean Williams, uh, look look me up on LinkedIn. I'm sure there are a lot of them. Yeah, Sean C. Williams, Fortis Mortgage. <laughs> um, uh, my, our website is FortisMortgage.com, F-O-R-T-I-S. Uh, uh, and uh, the handles that I'm doing because I'm working on my own personal brand mm -hmm. because I'm going all in on uh, home ownership uh -huh. uh, uh, at Sean Home Loans, uh -huh. S-H-A-W-N, Home Loans. Excellent, excellent. Well, Sean, thank you so much for coming on Manage Your Damn Money and sharing your story. Uh, I want to remind people you can always catch past episodes of Manage Your Damn Money on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. And of course, please leave us a review on any of those platforms. That helps more people catch the show. And if you'd like to send us a topic suggestion, send it to us, info at managerdamnmoney.com. You can always catch us on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, my handle's at mydm one Malcolm, what's yours? At Malcolm on Money. Of course, you can always catch us on Facebook, facebook.com backslash managerdamnmoney. Thanks once again to our partners here at Montgomery Community Media for another amazing show. Until next time, be good with your money. Peace. Peace.